the issue I want to cover is uh, uh, going to from the general to the particular. So attempts that are very common in contemporary philosophy of reducing or eliminating the phenomena that are part of the ordinary view of the world, including ethical properties, why these attempts are not working and give an example of that in regard to phronesis and uh, how we should treat considered phronesis. So I'll share a presentation. Uh, okay. <clears throat> okay, then let's, I have a lot of, okay, so, uh, scientific naturalism is the most common version nowadays of naturalism, but also I think the most common metaphilosophy in the Anglo-Saxon world. So the inspirers of uh, this view are being uh, Quine, Sellers, uh, uh, Dennett, and uh, uh, the Churchland, and many others. So there are three tenets of this view. The first, first one is ontological. Reality consists of nothing more than the entities to which the successful explanations of the natural sciences commit us. Okay, so the only true ontology is given to us by science or at least by a future mature science. This means also that whatever we think is real in the natural, in the world, but is not in principle uh, reconducible to, cannot be reduced to scientific phenomena, is not real. Second, there is an epistemological tenet. Uh, scientific inquiry is our only genuine source of knowledge, where scientific means the natural sciences. All other uh, alleged forms of knowledge, like a priori knowledge, phenomenological knowledge, introspection, are either reducible in principle to scientific knowledge or Ill illegitimate, okay? And third, this is a corollary really, but it's a concern of philosophy, it's a metaphilosophical tenet. Philosophy must be continuous with science as to its contents, methods, and purposes. So for example, when time talking about epistemology, theory of knowledge, uh, tongue in cheek, but with a, uh, expressing what he really thought, Quine said that epistemology is a branch of engineering in the sense that there is nothing irreducible normative in knowledge and justification. Um, everything could be explained by referring to psychology and neuroscience. There is no space for, uh, in philosophy for notions that are not uh, naturalistically co-share. So they, this produces immediately a problem, the so-called placement problem. That John Searle has defined this problem, the overriding question in contemporary philosophy. How can we square a conception of ourselves as mindful, meaning-creating, free, rational, et cetera, agents with a universe that consists, consists entirely of mindless, meaningless and free non-rational brute physical particles. This is the most important problem in contemporary philosophy, Searle says. And this is Hugh Price, an Australian philosopher now at Cambridge, that has actually uh, created the label, the placement problem. And he says, if all reality is ultimately natural reality, how are we to place moral facts, mathematical facts, meaning facts and so on, how are we to locate topics of these kinds within a naturalistic framework thus conceived? So remember this, the question is how to locate the kinds that are, uh, you know, normative kinds or uh, abstract kinds, intentional kinds in the natural world. This is the question. Um, <clears throat> So the question is, what should we think of the seemingly indispensable features of the world, the seemingly 
basically escape the natural sciences, right? So uh, this, this is the question. And this is questions apply to the full, at least the following items, free will, self-consciousness, color, colors and other secondary properties, phenomenological properties, collective intentionality, mathematical truths, meta mental properties, time, financial debts. This is uh, was suggested to me by Barry Smith, Buffalo Barry Smith, who noticed that we cannot really talk about financial debts if we only talk uh, user language uh, given by the uh, natural sciences. Musical properties and the ethical properties. All these things become doubtful if we take the perspective of scientific naturalism. And let's look at the ethical side. The placement problem in ethics. This is Simon Blackburn who writes, the problem is one of finding room for ethics or placing ethics within the disenchanted non-ethical order which we inhabit and of which we are a part. So the metaphor of placing, right? It's very important here. So the only real world is the one where we want to place ethics. And this is disenchanted, non-ethical, non-normative, non-intentional. This is the world. And we have to find a place for things that seems, seem in enchanted, ethical, normative, and intentional, okay? So um, there is a priority of the natural world as it is presented by the natural sciences. It's the only one. So whatever doesn't fit their world represents a problem. Um, so this is the problem. Now let's see the three, the three strategies that uh, scientific naturalists appeal to for solving the placement problem. One is reductionism, the usual technique, the usual strategy. Um, the model is the one taken from science. Uh, uh, so for example, water, the liquid, uh, tasteless, colorless, uh, 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 liquid that uh, we drink um, has been reduced to something else, something deeper, something real. This is uh, chemistry. So two atoms of hydrogen and one of oxygen. That is what water is, okay? H2O. This is a reduction. So the, the ideal is to reduce uh, the features that I mentioned earlier. So free will, consciousness, moral properties, to the properties of the natural sciences. This is the first attempt. And there is uh, a huge amount of attempts in this direction. Second, more radical, eliminata eliminativism. So to eliminate uh, the features that are cannot be reduced, um, to natural properties or features. They have to be eliminated from our, uh, from the furniture of the world. So if properties or numbers, abstract entities or uh, uh, intentional properties cannot be reduced to uh, the properties of the natural sciences have to be eliminated. And there are a lot of attempts in this direction. Finally, this is a more, a more uh, uh, less common, but interesting view, Mysterianism, advocated especially by, in general, by um, Chomsky and Colin McGinn, but also in some fields by Thomas Nagel and even Peter Benningwegen. Um, so this would be a three, not a two. Let's uh, give a brief, I cannot enter in detail so here, but more, uh, let's talk about morality, moral reductionism. I'll give you an idea of how a modern reduction uh, should work if it works. So these are, is represent a typical attempt. There is a reductionist by the Cornell School, uh, for example, and uh, the Michigan School, they try to make reductions. Well, this is one standard way you're trying this. Um, one has to be objectivist about uh, uh, ethics, because the point, yes? Close the microphone. 
Eh? Chiudi il microfono. Ok, let's hope that now we can go on. Uh, so, the idea that we are taking moral property seriously, because if we think that they don't exist, that they are illusions, that they are queer entities and so cannot be accepted, the problem solved. But if we take the, we have the idea that moral uh, properties are true, with, there is a problem. So they have to be reduced. This is the way it works. So moral statements can be true. Uh, this is, uh, uh, so you have to be objectivist about morality, right? You think that, for example, saying torturing, torturing children is morally wrong. It has to be true uh, in a strong sense, not true in, within a story, not true in a deflationist way. It has to be true. It's true. Like uh, the water is H2O or uh, today is, uh, what is it today? Wednesday. So it's true, this is the assumption. Now, the truth and moral statements depend on the existence of moral property to which these statements refer. So this is standard uh, uh, truth view, right? Conception of the truth. So if a statement is true, it's because it describes the world as it is. So if a moral statement is true, it means that this, the, um, the properties it, it refers are uh, real. They exist. This is uh, so moral realism. From moral objectivism about the moral statements, uh, they moral reductionists go on and say they are more realist about properties. But only natural properties can be real. We can only causally interact with the natural properties. So they say, so uh, we cannot accept the idea that. Moral properties are not natural. So conclusion, moral properties are natural. So are natural, they can be studied by the uh, natural sciences. There have been two main attempts of explaining this view. One is that moral properties are reducible to non-moral properties. I don't know, for example, so some particular states of the minds or something like that. But of course, no convincing attempts proposal has been done in this way. So what could be the non-moral properties to which all moral properties can be reduced? No one has a serious proposal in this sense. Then there is another view. This is the Cornell view, according to which moral properties are natural, but they are uh, special pro natural properties. They are. Uh, they cannot be reduced to non-moral properties. Um, this is even more complicated to accept. So there are moral properties in the natural world that are, na are natural, uh, but are different from all other natural properties. My quick way of saying that this is not convincing is that more the essential feature of more and moral properties is that Moral properties are normative properties. Moral properties are connected with the idea that some behavior or action uh, that, that that property can be, can be uh, correct or incorrect, just or wrong. So they are normative. These properties have a moral character, a normative character, and no natural property has a moral a normative character. Normativity cannot be translated in the natural ger the, the jargon of the natural sciences. So if a moral property is and the natural, sorry, the moral properties are supposed to be natural by preserving their normativity, the attempt doesn't work. It, if they don't preserve their normativity, they are not moral properties anymore. Okay, so I don't think moral reductionism works. And this is uh, a quote by my, my great inspirer Hilary Patram, uh, when he talks about these reductions in general, not just in moral philosophy. None of these ontological reductions gets believed by anyone except the proponent of the account to one or two of his friends and or students. And that seems to be true. So the idea is that there is a, a commonly shared idea that more, I mean, at least uh, so many people believe that moral properties, for example, can be reduced to 
natural properties. But then when you go on with concrete proposals, no one proposes anything acceptable. So really reductionism in, in uh, moral philosophy doesn't work, even less than in other fields. So what about moral eliminativism? I want to uh, look at the Luciferian uh, expression of Alex Rosenberg that writes this. Science forces upon us a very disillusioned take on reality. It forces us to say no in response to many questions to which almost everyone hopes the answers are yes. These are questions about purpose in nature, the meaning of life, the grounds of morality, the significance of con consciousness, the character of thought, the freedom of the will, limits of human understanding and the trajectory of human history. So everything that we believe in, uh, our most cherished uh, ideas about ourselves. So the grounds of morality, for example, that's a, we should, should say no, they don't exist. The freedom of the will is an illusion. This is eliminativism. Uh, there are other attempts, famously. So the Paul and Patricia Churchland have advocated the idea that uh, intentional psychology should be eliminated because it is just a wrong theory of the of the mind or the or how the mind works. Uh, they think that uh, intentional psychology is a theory with the same uh, status of the phlogiston theory in chemistry, something that was believed at some point, but then was proved wrong. There are there are eliminativist attempts in philosophy of mathematics, like uh, Hartree-Field. Hartree-Field uh, says that we cannot accept abstract entities, the existence of abstract entities, because we can only accept entities with which we are in, in a causal interaction, causal contact. So we cannot, by definition, we cannot interact with the abstract entities. So there are no sets, there are no numbers. And so consequently, the uh, uh, truth value of the statement two plus two is four is the same truth value of the statement Oliver Twist was born in London. That is, is true in, within a story, but objectively false. So two plus two is, Four is a false statement. This is, and there are uh, eliminativist attempts everywhere. Now, let me say something by Patram again. Um, when he talks about the normative specifically, the elimination of the normative is attempting moral suicide, that, which is due to a horror of the normative. Uh, according to Patram, the normative is everywhere. I'm writing a paper called a Patlamian paper called The Place of Facts in a World of Values, in the sense that for him, uh, we cannot really distinguish facts from values because all our best theories of the world, including scientific theories, have a, a normative uh, character. So uh, normativity is, is everywhere. The attempt to eliminate normativity is just absurd, including the fact that, think about for example, church, the churchlands, right? Churchlands, they say uh, intentional psychology uh, is false. It appeals to entities that don't exist. We should abandon such a bad theory. Um, so we should abandon the idea of belief, for example. Beliefs don't exist. Well, why should then the churchland believe in their theory? Why should they ask us not to believe in our theory? To believe in their theory if beliefs doesn't exist. So uh, sometimes there are um, really um, contradictions really in this uh, attempts to eliminate everything. Uh, I won't get into details but for example the attempt to eliminate free will that's allegedly proved either on a, a priori basis or an empirical basis First of all, it's very unconvincing. Second of all, second of all would have terrible cons practical consequences, but I don't have time to expand on this. Okay, let's go to the third strategy after reductionism and eliminativism of the, the, how the scientific naturalist approach uh, morality. So moral mysterianism. This is Col Colin McGinn, 
who writes, we can't make any progress in understanding ethics for the same reason that we make so little progress in unassisted flying. That is, we lack the requisite equipment. We have gaps in our cognitive skills as we have gaps in our motor skills. So in both cases, we can see what we are missing and feel the resulting frustration. This is McGinn in one of his typical positions. And uh, so what is the point here? Uh, according to McGinn, that inspired by Chomsky on this, as a species, as a biological species, no, we are not smart enough to solve the problems that, you know, normative notions, uh, uh, consciousness, free will, and so on, raise with us. Uh, the problem is that the only way of explaining for McGinn is to use naturalistic explanations. And we cannot reach any good naturalistic explanation of uh, intentional normative phenomena and so on. At the same time, McGinn is honest, intellectually honest enough to say that we cannot simply, we cannot abandon these notions. We cannot imagine a world in which we will live without believing in free will, consciousness, self-consciousness, responsibility, and so on. So we have to live with the mystery. Um, the consequence for him is that uh, philosophy is futile because it doesn't get any knowledge, cannot do anything because these are unsolvable mysteries. So the main problem in philosophy, how to explain the uh, recalcitrant features uh, that don't fit the scientific view of the world cannot be solved. So philosophy uh, is doing something useless, really. Okay, here, let me refer to another very dear late friend of mine, uh, Lean Baker, who wrote, we should, I totally agree with this idea. We should not embrace a metaphysics that makes mundane, but significant phenomena unintelligible. So what she's saying is, so, Let's take Mysterianism, for example, or eliminativism. So this view pretend to tell us that the things that are most important in our worldview, uh, so freedom, responsibility, etc., are either false or unintelligible. Unintelligible. So let's take uh, uh, the the uh, argument by. Call him again, not as a modus ponens that goes this way. The uh, all explanations have been naturalistic, um, intentional and normative uh, phenomena cannot be explained in naturalistically. Conclusion: they are mysteries. Let's take it as a modus tollens that says, uh, saying we deny one of the premises. We deny the premises that all explanations should be uh, given by the natural sciences. Let's try differently. So not all natural uh, is, uh, good explanations are given by the natural sciences. At this point, we have decent explanations see how it, of how it works with uh, freedom, morality, intentional psychology. Let me say something about intentional psychology, for example. Um, according to the Churchland, uh, intentional psychology is a bad theory. But this is a result of their a priori assumption that theories should be uh, modeled on the natural sciences. Because if you take another approach and you say, what's the best way we have to explain human behavior? Certainly it's not neuroscience, not even psychology. It's common sense, <laughs> intentional psychology. I mean, they attributing beliefs, desires, fears to people is the best way we have by large in order to explain them. So uh, if we use a common inference to the best explanation, we should accept um, intentional psychology as the best explanation of our uh, psychological world. And so far from uh, eliminating it, we should accept it unless we are under the spell of the idea that Panton, uh, Patron mentioned of the horror of the normative, horror of the intentional. If we don't start from there, we have to acknowledge that uh, intentional psychology works pretty well in explaining those strange entities, entities that surround us, other human beings. Um, okay, uh, so my proposal that I've defended in many books and articles 
uh, is liberal naturalism. And so let's uh, look at the liberalized tenets of this view. There is a liberalized ontological tenet. Some real entities uh, exist that are irreducible to, but not incompatible with the entities that are part of the coverage domain of a science-based ontology. This set briefly, conceive of nature and the natural in a wider sense than uh, the natural uh, scientific naturalists do. So until John Dewey included John Dewey, there was this idea. Nature inclu certainly includes the features that are studied by the uh, natural sciences, but there is much more than that. There is uh, uh, there are the social sciences, there is common sense, there is what the arts are about. All these parts were considered natural by, by the pragmatists, for example, many others. Nowadays, there has been this big change. The object of the natural sciences is considered coextensive with nature. This is a new idea started in the middle the middle of the last century, and I think it's a wrong one. There is more to nature than the subject of the um, natural sciences. The second tenet of liberal naturalism is a liberalized epistemological tenet. Some legitimate forms of understanding, a priori reasoning, introspection, intuitions, and so on, are neither reducible to scientific understanding nor incompatible with it. This is how we do mathematics, for example. This is how we do self-interpretation, for example. This is how we do uh, reasoning in many fields a priori, right, including mathematics. Uh, and these are not necessarily reducible to the ways in which uh, science is done. Actually, it can even be more. It could be that even in the sciences, these uh, forms of understanding are necessary much more than uh, uh, scientific naturalists assume, but that is another issue. Third, the liberalized metaphysical tenet. There are issues in dealing with which philosophy is not continuous with science as to its content, method, and purpose, e even if, if to, it should be not at odds with it. So the idea is this. Uh, in some cases, science has to be continuous with the sciences. Sorry, philosophy has to be continuous with the natural sciences. In some fields, when we study, I don't know, language or even free will, about some of the features, components of these problems, we should refer with science, work with science, but not necessarily so. There are parts of philosophy that we are not, um, that is not necessary or not even good to connect philosophy and science. Let's take ethics. Of course, moral psychology has to be connected with ethics, but uh, with science, sorry. Moral psychology has to be connected with science. But other part of moral, uh, for example, uh, normative ethics are not necessarily connected with science, I think. But being a form of naturalism, perhaps Aristotelian naturalism, we don't want that uh, what we say in philosophy is at odds with the natural sciences tell us about the world. Uh, this framework, the frameworks given by these three tenets generates a re resolutely pluralistic attitude. One has to be pluralist in ontology, in epistemology, in philosophical methodology. Even I haven't said much about this here, but just let me hint it, even causality. I think, and this is another uh, gift that Aristotle gave to us. I think that when we talk about causality, we shouldn't assume the typical neo, it's called neo-human neo view. Um, perhaps, uh, wait, okay, you should turn off the, the mic of somebody, I don't know whom. Done. Okay. Now something else came out. I don't know what they want. Okay. Well, even in causality, we need to have the idea that there is no priority of physical causality or not over the other forms of causality. To put it differently, uh, um, 
Causality depends on the interest we have when we ask questions. Um, I, I may say something more about that. But when we ask normative questions, we are not asking for a scientific explanation. Um, okay. Uh, so pluralistic attitude in ontology, epistemology, and philosophy. Okay, let's briefly go to the last point. Uh, the attempt made by this brilliant philosopher, uh, scientist, psychologist at Notre Dame, Daniel Lapsley, who is a friend, and uh, we, um, I've been with, doing this work with Maria Silvia Vaccarezza, with Claudia Navarini, with Ricardo Brunetti, with all the friends of Aredai, and so Lapsley, Daniel Lapsley is a friend, but I fear he is wrong in this respect because it thinks that practical wisdom has to be eliminated. Let's uh, look at uh, what he says in this respect. Uh, he says the various functions over interpretations of phronesis, phronesis is practical wisdom, translate in a striped way into robust psychological literatures concerning metacognitive development. So phronesis is interpreted as a meta virtue, social cognitive personality theory, phronesis as cognitive effective perception inside, and moral self-identity, phronesis as moral character. So phronesis has become a, a notion that is, has been used in psychology. But translation, according to Napsley, brings both promise and peril. The perilous translation comes in two forms. So using the notion of phronesis in a psychology uh, has two uh, dangers. One is that phronesis is absurd into psychological frameworks with no clear value-added explanatory role other than what is otherwise provided by psychological theory. In this case, phronesis becomes something like the luminous, the ether, the luminous of luminiferous ether theory, once held the critically necessary to explain the transmission of light until later Einstein's special relativity found it superfluous. That's not entirely true because it was the experiment by Michelson and Morley that proved that that was superfluous. But anyway, uh, the second parallel is that phronesis is held out as a psychological variable in its own right, which must seem like the only way psychologists will get it right about virtue and character. So I want to suggest the possibility that the role of phronesis in Aristotelian virtue, virtue ethics is much like the role of ether in physics one thought crucial but now expendable. It would not be clear just what phronesis is, what it's supposed to do, or what it would explain in which case the use of phronetic lexicon becomes optional, superfluous, or distracting, or a form of special pleading. This is eliminativism again. So, because either, uh, the argument is this, either uh, phronesis doesn't add anything to psychological explanations, or if he add, I think that psycholog psychology cannot tolerate because they are not, not naturalistic, naturalistically acceptable. Maria Silvia Vaccarizza summarizes in a very good way. In sum, we have here a naturalistic conundrum according to Lapsley. Either phronesis is nat naturalizable, so reducible, so translatable into psychological variables, in which case it's philosophical import is redundant. So if we reduce phronesis, it's over. It doesn't exist anymore. It doesn't add anything to psychology, or it is not in which case it is expendable. If it's not, not is what he says. He says that if uh, 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 phronesis is not re reducible, then it has to be abandoned. But he doesn't say that phronesis doesn't say anything. He's assumed that what phronesis says that is not reducible cannot be accepted because it's not part of the psychological vocabulary. Uh, but where can we find phronesis? Um, look at what I think. This is exactly a form of liberal naturalism. Phronesis is a normative property. Its type cannot be individuated at the neurophysiological level, but only at the normative level. I think that the second uh, possibility is here, uh, where Lapsley says uh, the use uh, it would not be, um, Fronesi is held out as psychological variable in its own right, which must seem like the, um, so it, it, what uh, here is suggesting, uh, Lapsley is suggesting that it may be that it's irreducible, but then we have to abandon it. So we can, we, I, I agree that it's not reducible. For the type of the property of uh, is not a psychological type, but, 
Uh, I also think that each instantiation of phronesis corresponds to a neurophysiological token. So every time we have an example of phronesis, a phronetic action, there has to be some neurophysiological, physical description of what happened. But the property cannot be read at the level of the neurophysiology and physics, but only at the upper level, the normative level, where we explain what should be done and what should not be done. This is the normative level. This is where phronesis works. If you take away normativity from phronesis, you waste phronesis. Phronesis is dead. It doesn't work. It's, it's right. If you take it at the pro psychological level, it, treat it as another psychological function, it's not phronesis anymore. Because what is essential in phronesis is to connect it with normativity. What you, sh what you should do, and what you shouldn't do. Whereas psychological norms, sorry, psychological functions are connected to what we do, in fact. Uh, so non-reductionism and non-eliminativism. We cannot abandon phronesis. Phronesis is essential for explaining morality. At the same time, it cannot be reduced to the psychological level, even if it's instantiated at the neurophysiological level. So every time we have phronesis, we have a, a physical event, but the physical event doesn't, it's not a part of a physical property or type that would uh, make it clear what phronesis is. In order to see phronesis, we have to go to the normative level. And the relationship between these two levels, the normative level and neurophysiological level, is one of global supervening. So every time that is a variation at the normative level, so two uh, different uh, normative situations cannot have the same, uh, cannot be correlated to the same neurophysiological level. Whereas you can have the same uh, normative level instantiated by different physical levels. So I can be, for example, I can decide to compromise between justice and uh, courage or something like that when I have a conflict of uh, virtues that is what typically phronesis does in a way in which this can be done in many different situations. The property, the phronetic property is the same, but the, uh, it's instantiated on a different physical token. Um, so the idea is that phronesis is not eliminable, not reduct, uh, re cannot be reduced, but still naturalistically acceptable, as long as you, uh, you accept the idea that there is not only one world or one level of reality. There is not only the physical level. There is not only the level of nature that is the one that is studied by the natural sciences. There, is a, there are other levels. There is the level of abstract entities, but there is also the level of the ordinary view of the world in which normativity does an excellent job in accounting for what happens to us and our fellows. Conclusion. Liberal nationalism offers the best metaphilosophical background for developing a satis satisfactory version of virtue ethics, one in which we do not commit intellectual suicide, as Patram said, by attempting to eliminate the essential normative notion of phronesis. Okay, thank you very much.